Any uh, other comments uh, before we move on? Okay, uh, we're going to do something different this time. Uh, Scott, a couple week, weeks ago, uh, suggested we have a, a class just dedicated to uh, questions that people bring up. And we have some written questions here that we're going to cover. But if anyone has anything they want to bring up, as long as we have time, uh, you can do that too. So uh, during the class, if any question comes to mind, you know, hold that till the end. And if we have extra time, we'll, we'll cover them. Uh, Scott gave me quite a list of questions. So I'll start with... Um, we had uh, also questions from Annie and Joshua, so we will uh, uh, cover them first, and then uh, we'll go into Scott's questions uh, after we finish these. Um, first of all, Annie asked this question about pedophilia. She says, how are the energies twisted? Can it be healed? And if yes, what needs to be looked at in oneself to do that? Well, the, the big problem with, uh, the big cause as I see it with pedophilia is uh, uh, centered around the need of every human being to have power. Every human being makes almost Every does everything he does in life is to increase his power. He goes to work and make a living to have money, to have power to eat, house himself, have fun or whatever. And everything is everything we do is motivated by power. And when people feel powerless, then they look toward uh exercising power over somebody else so that they can have this sense of power. Now, if everybody had their minds in the light, they could see that they have unlimited power available. But because people's minds are darkened, they see themselves as lacking power. And some of the weakest people in the fact that they see themselves as most powerless or the people that prey upon the weak. And the easiest people to prey upon are children because they, their minds aren't fully developed and their bodies aren't. They don't have the power to resist. And so it gives uh, a person that sees himself as very weak uh, uh, position where he actually has power over somebody else. And uh, this, this shows itself in many evils among us. You know, it could be a, like a dominating uh, maid and a marriage will have power over the mate and, uh, and abuse them. Uh, people will abuse their children. People will abuse their friends. Uh, people in authority will hire and fire uh, uh, just to exercise authority. And uh, uh, so people that feel that they're lacking in power will do everything they can to grab whatever power they can. And, and at the bottom of the whole rung is the people that uh, prey upon little children because they feel that they are uh, lacking power. And so they, uh, that little children are the easiest people to overpower. And it's kind of sad that somebody reaches that level. And uh, the cure for them will be to, for, to get some therapy or teaching or implant in their mind that tells them the true path to power. And if they can obtain uh, more power over their own lives, then they won't, have, they won't feel that impulse. And the reason there's so much 
repetition with us and it's so hard to cure is because these people are not shown the path to power. And so even if they're thrown in prison over it and they get out, they still do the same thing over again if they have the opportunity. They just can't help themselves because it's built in our nature to increase our position of power. Uh, it's just not power hungry people that are that way. Everybody's that way. What we see is power hungry people are really people that do not, do not understand power and have to go about achieving it by producing victims. But uh, for the person in the light, there are no victims. Power will be something to serve and he will be seeking power to serve. And once a person's motive is, is pure so that he's seeking power to serve, then more power will come to him. If he's seeking power to destroy, then less power will come to them. And then he'll have to seek weaker and weaker people to overcome. Okay, does that make sense, Annie? Yes, absolutely. That's a very logic explanation. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on that subject? Or comments? Okay. Uh, okay, she asked another question. Um, how does a dweller feel like uh, anger, sorrow, depression, or can he be all of them and more? All negative emotions and thoughts dependent on who you are or were. Well, lower life forms uh, don't really feel the way that we do, but they can attach to our feelings. And uh, the, uh, the lower life forms are more reactionary, whereas human life and higher, we think things out and then make a decision. Whereas lower life forms just are more reactive. So the dweller is like a repository of our negative thoughts that we have accumulated in all of our lifetimes. And uh, when certain buttons are pressed then certain reactions are activated by elemental lives that uh, create the dweller. And so uh, uh, the dweller doesn't like uh, feel angry the way that we do, but he reacts, it, it reacts to anger. And one thing that all lives have in common is they seek to perpetuate their own life. And so when life gets threatened, any life from a little fly to uh, an elephant, when any life get thre gets threatened, it does what it can do to preserve itself. And, and, this is, and the dweller does that too. The dweller seeks to preserve itself and uh, uh, to uh, uh, keep your thoughts focused in such a way that it can feed off of uh, lower energies in your uh, makeup. Okay, any uh, feedback or questions or comments on the dweller? I have a question on that, JJ. Yeah. You just said the dweller feeds off the lower energies of our makeup. And yeah. I, that's one of the things I'm trying to understand. The, the energy, if it feeds off of it, let's say it absorbs the energy and then where does that energy go into the dweller? I mean, does it, does it come in and stay there or does it stay there for a time and then dissipate out somewhere else? Well, it's like food. Uh, you have to have a certain amount of input of food to keep your life going. And the dweller is the same way. It needs a certain amount of negative energy to keep its uh, uh, life going in connection with you. And so uh, 
one of the best things you can do with your dweller is uh, uh, is to starve it to death <laughs> and uh, not give it the food it wants. It still has a li life uh, even after uh, it's starved, so to speak. It can always be revitalized, but uh, uh, it has. If you don't. If you uh, don't feed it with negative energy, it will lose its power. And uh, but before it loses its power, at the time of its greatest power, it will uh, uh, you'll have an experience where you encounter your dweller, where you have to face it and eventually uh, dissipate it. But uh, and that's that's. Uh, that's what they call the experience of the dweller on the threshold. Isn't that where you go through the dark night of the soul where you, where you overcome the negative influence of your dweller? What's called the dark night of the soul is usually the time period before the actual encounter happens where you will uh, uh, go through uh, a period where you're not um sure if you connected to anything <laughs> you, where you think maybe even god has deserted you perhaps but like uh, when christ was on the cross Did um you? not exactly he was kind of beyond that but uh it's still a kind of a higher correspondence of that where he said my god my god why has thou forsaken me and so uh, uh, there's correspondences in different cycles, so it's you could call that a lower correspondence of that, perhaps. Yeah. But uh, okay, uh, yeah, Christ's experience with the dweller is uh, happened in his uh, temptations in the desert when he went after he was baptized and he encountered. Uh, uh, Satan there, which was his dweller on the threshold, and he had to overcome uh, the, the uh, negative directions the dweller was trying to take him. But everybody's encounter with the dweller will be a little bit different. You won't, you won't have an encounter exactly like that. When yours happens, it'll be tailor-made just for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Anything else on that then? Okay, now Joshua asks a question. He says, um, how can trust and love be developed where they do not exist? Well, first of all, love exists everywhere. So love definitely exists. Okay, now, um, Love just has to be seen. For instance, uh, let's pick on somebody here like Rulina. Let's say uh, you had a fight with Rulina and you think she's the ornery top person you don't want to associate with. Well, she still got bundles of love underneath everything there. So she, she's, uh, uh, love is within her. You just have to remove the clouds and see it, okay? Because all of us have the Christ within us. And so that love just has to manifest. Now, perhaps he means it in this direction. How can you get somebody to love you if they don't want to love you, okay? Well, you, you, you can't really, you have to, with some people, you just have to um, accept them the way they are. And if they don't want to respond with love, then realize that love, they're just not seeing what is already there. And they're not manifesting what is there to manifest. It's like the guy with a, a buried treasure on his front lawn, but he doesn't know it's there. So it's like it's not really there, even though it is there. Uh, and that's the way it is with love. Love is there whether you know it or not. So if someone 
isn't at a state of consciousness where he's able to share love, there's uh, not much you can do and except just be kind and wait for this person to develop and uh, show it. Now, as far as trust goes, um, you when you first meet somebody, you don't know if you can trust them or not. Um, trust is something that has to be developed over a period of time. Let's suppose that you had a, a secret like um, you lived in Nazi Germany and uh, you knew something and if you told somebody about it and word got out, it meant you would be arrested and, and uh, shot, okay? Well, who are you gonna tell about this? It'd have to be somebody who you, you would really trust. So if, uh, you, if you have three friends, say you have one friend you tell stuff to and you say, don't tell anybody and they, they go tell everybody. Well, you know that friend, you can't trust him with this secret. And a second person you've told stuff to and he's leaked some stuff out and some he hasn't, but still this is really important. So you don't trust him either. A third friend, you have confided in him and he's never broken his confidence. So this person, this is the only person you would trust in that situation. Trust, trust has to be uh, uh, earned. Yeah, earned is the right word. Trust has to be earned over a period of time. And uh, now probably, Nobody is 100% trustworthy because everybody has their limitations. Let's take Curtis over here. He's on my screen right now. Let's say uh, some, the government got a hold of him and wanted some secrets out of him and they started torturing him. After he got tortured enough, he'd probably be willing to say most anything. <laughs> I blurred it all out. <laughs> and, it's amazing how many people think they wouldn't, but if it actually happened to them, uh, it's amazing how people will give in once they become threatened or in enough pain or whatever. Uh, most people would, would uh, have, have a, has a breaking point. So all of us can, in the physical reality, can only be trusted so much. <laughs> Probably nobody, nobody alive is worthy of being trusted 100% in all situations. So with all of your friends, you have to get to know, uh, get a sense of them. How far can I trust them? And you get a sense of people, of people after you know them for a period of time, uh, how far that trust can, can go. And if you, if you have a friend that would, is, is so trustworthy he would uh, die before he would break that trust. Well, then, then you really got a, a golden friend there, which probably few and far between, but they, they do exist. Okay, any uh, comments or questions on trust? Well, that, that's an interesting subject, you know, like if you're captured by the North Vietnamese and you're told to denounce your your uh, American, uh, my commitment or my dedication to America or whatever, deny the Constitution. Yeah, you know that's that's one thing. Yeah, I could say uh, I could deny anything, but if you're entrusted with information like sacred information, uh, like certain keys of knowledge that are not to be shared then, you know, that's a different level of, of commitment of trust. That's, that's, that's like, you know, yeah, you know, I would suffer my life to be taken before I would divulge certain secrets or signs or tokens of, of a royal priesthood. And knowing that, you know, life is temporary in this body and I'll, I'll, I'll resurface. Um, so I, you know, there are different things that you want to hold sacred, um, 
Uh, yeah, I could deny my allegiance to this country, knowing that I'm not really denying it. I'm just saying it. But sometimes there's information that you just have to hold secret. Right, and the high disciples are uh, are willing to even forfeit their lives before they will violate the trust of uh, uh, the uh, that is entrusted to them through the spirit. And so uh, uh, th that's something to take in consideration. We should all aspire to uh, be trustworthy to that extent to that extent. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of problems with trust so is just thoughtlessness. Sometimes people just don't think of what they're doing and they they wind up violating somebody's trust and sometimes they're not even aware of the, there's a problem. <laughs> so uh, uh, that happens too. And uh, sometimes uh, people of quite innocent that are accused of violating trust and there's all kinds of dimensions to trust, but trust is important. I believe as Leonardo da Vinci said, to be trusted is greater than to be loved. And I always like that, uh, that, that quote, because uh, you can find lots of people you can fall in love with, but uh, somebody you would really trust with your life or whatever would, are, uh, are really jewels of, among the human race. Okay. Um, any other comments on that before we move on to Scott's questions here? I've got a question, JJ. Yeah. So, um, you and Curtis answered that question with an extreme example. It, it, it's sort of easy to understand, but what about, uh, you know, we're trying to build love and trust within the, this group, uh, if it's necessary for the molecule. We don't really have the opportunity to uh, tell each other rumors and see if someone else keeps it a secret or not. But <laughs> yeah. how, how do we how do we build trust and love within the group when we don't have really contact with each other? Well, that's a good question. Anybody got any uh, ideas on that before I give my two cents? How, how can we build more trust um, and support in this particular. Well, well, I got a, I got a question. Uh, when you say uh, you would want to build trust in the group, uh, what is it that you would want to trust? Um, your love. Uh, you give your love freely, uh, so you're not asking for reward. So um, you have to kind of self uh, contemplate. What is it that I want to trust this group with? I think that's where it would start from, uh, knowing exactly what it is that you uh, would put trust in another person for. And then when you contemplate a group of people, work on that end, maybe. I'm just... Well, you made a good point there, Stacy, because no, for, for one thing, in group work, you have to accept the fact that nobody's perfect, okay? So, uh, probably nobody's 100% trustworthy and 100% of every situation. So we look at each other and we look beyond the personality to the Christ and we look to the perfection that is there. And this is what, how DK, what DK said about Christ as to how he healed. He said he healed others by seeing the perfection that was in them and speaking to the perfection within their souls. So uh, uh, somebody that was very imperfect and had a disease came to him, he did not, not see the disease. He saw a perfect human being. And by seeing the perfection, the body followed, energy follows thought. And so um, uh, by this is a, another important point is that by seeing the perfection in others, they will actually perform much better. Reminds me of a story, this um, uh, school teacher took on this class and a uh, new class and she was warned that there's this particular kid in the class that is really hard to control and uh, she really needs to come down hard on this kid. 
Well, she had different ideas though. When she entered the class, she uh, called the boy aside that's supposed to be the big problem. And she says to the boy, uh, you know, uh, I hear this, this class has a, a few problems in it and I want you to help me out uh, because if people get out of hand, you know, uh, I think you're the guy that, that can help me uh, kind of stabilize things. And it turned out that this kid just totally turned around instead of being the big problem kid. He was the kid that was the biggest help to her just because she uh, uh, showed some trust in him that nobody else did. And by showing trust and faith and love toward others causes it to amplify. It's not a cure-all, but it's a stimulant. It plants seeds. Okay. Any comment on well, that? One, one thing um, along those lines, as far as trust goes, let's say now Ed's in my triad. I trust that Ed will do what he says he will do. Ed always keeps his agreements. And the, the other thing I trust about Ed is he's available. <laughs> he sure is. <laughs> he's available. You know, he, if I need something from Ed, if I say, hey, I, wanna, I want you to bring me over some zucchini or whatever, you know, he's, he's pretty much 99% trustworthy that he will do what he says he will do. I mean, that's the highest level of trust yeah. is that, yeah, that, that people are A, available, and B, keep their agreements with each other. Yeah. I think it relates to integrity. We have, ha we have to have a personal sense of our own integrity and uh, we trust ourselves. I know one thing Curtis has told me is he, it really irritates him if people aren't on time for an appointment. He likes to be on time. And uh, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's one kind of just one of the small things of life that uh, people can do to uh, uh, stimulate trust is just to deliver when they say they will. Okay, any other comments on that? Okay, we'll get to Scott's questions here. He has some unusual ones. He says, Elijah, Elisha, David all seem to appear to be at least at the same level as Paul. Do they ascend to the Brotherhood of Light somewhere? If not, are they part of the second coming festivities? Okay, uh, well, it's hard to say on all these, uh, uh, but Elijah probably uh, is a master by now, but uh, uh, we're not given details on all these, uh, in, especially the biblical individuals, uh, as to where they are. But everybody progresses. And some of the people that are the biblical figures uh, undoubtedly uh, have reincarnated. Others become masters. Now, keep in mind that all the masters are not uh, working with humanity. Like we have certain masters that we know about, like uh, DK Kuthumi and Master Moria and so on. Uh, they, uh, their specific mission is to work with uh, humanity among other things. Those other people, when they become masters, they, uh, they uh, go beyond the physical body and uh, work in other realms. Uh, then there's others who work with the animal kingdom, vegetable kingdom, the mineral kingdom. And uh, so once a certain level of uh, uh, light is reached, they have uh, opportunity to, to do different types of functions. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, most of them stay pretty well connected to the human kingdom until they reach a certain level. And then they, uh, a lot of them move on and do other uh, means of 
methods of service. Okay, any uh, comment on that before we move on to the next question? Well, they pretty much have to liberate themselves from all karmic ties to move into other spheres of operation, I would think. So that right. would be a mess. Right. When, a, when a person becomes a master, he's pretty much neutralized his karma, right? Yeah. And so it'd be interesting if all of us knew exactly how much karma we had, good and bad, in the bank <laughs> or loaned out or whatever, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah, some of us might be alarmed if we if we knew. Karma <laughs> uh, causes. Yeah. Okay, he says, concerning Jacob wrestling with the angel, what was the angel's name? <laughs> I don't know why Scott would think that I would know the angel's name there, but uh, uh, why wasn't the angel strong, stronger? Is the angel's blessing a exclusive to that event or can our souls deliver a similar blessing to us is there anything an angel can do that our souls can't do angels have souls or are they different creatures than us well hey, first, JJ. first of all uh, soul uh every 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 soul goes through everything in material existence uh, the difference between a, a human and an animal or a flower is we have a higher percentage of soul energy flowing through us than the lower life forms. So uh, angel is everything. Everything has the soul energy flowing, flowing through them. Uh, yeah, Scott. I was just going to comment. I'm... Uh... I guess with some of these questions, I'm I'm not as well read as as some of you guys, and and uh, so I'm thinking that maybe throughout your studies of your lifetime, you've come across some of these things, and and I understand if you haven't, if the if the answer is not there, I understand that. Well, I just want to I just want to add something to the conversation because it, the angelic kingdom is a a parallel kingdom in nature. It's they're not human; they never were human. They're related to the matter side. They start with the involutionary elementals and, and they go into the evolutionary elementals and the devas and the angels and the archangels. And they work in connection with the will of the father. The angels, the devas are the builders of the form. Right, that's uh, now the many in the deva kingdom have never been human, but some of them do pass through the human kingdom. For instance, uh, DK tells us that the angel that appeared to uh, John the Revelator and given the book of Revelations was actually the Apostle Paul. Well, after the sixth initiation, it said that the uh, two streams of evolution merge. Yeah, yeah. So, so I found that interesting that uh, now the remember uh, John fell down at the angel's feet to worship him and he says worship me not for I am uh, thy fellow servant and of thy brethren and then DK reveals to us that it was actually the apostle Paul acting as a position of the angel now in the bible angel refers to the word uh, just yes, messenger and sometimes live human beings are called angels in the bible so uh, uh, that's a little bit different than the uh, Diva, Diva kingdom that you're talking about. And many of them have never been human. But, yeah, if you like to know, read a book called A Treatise on Cosmic Fire. Yeah. yeah well, the interesting thing about the angel that Jacob wrestled with, he wrestled through the, no the night, which I think was his dark night of the soul in the land of Peniel. And to awaken to his higher consciousness, he had to, uh, the correspondence would be to um, stimulate your pineal gland. So you're operating at the higher frequency of, of your monad and you're awakening to the angel of the presence. So he had to go through 
that dark night of the soul to, to connect with his angel in the land of Peniel, which was, I think is an interesting correspondence. And the angel, he was, he uh, wrestled all through the night and the angel um, was getting the better of him. And he threw his thigh at a joint and it really made Jacob mad. So Jacob threw the angel, reversed it, the, the position and got on top of him. And the angel said, let me up, let me up. And he said, no, not until you give me a new name and a blessing. And so he was given a new name, which was of course Israel because he, which means to prevail as a God because he prevailed over that, his, um, his, his that angel. And he was given a new name and a blessing, which I think each of us is uh, ultimately entitled to receive a new name and a blessing that comes only through the angel of your presence or the light of your own soul. Well, what's interesting is it doesn't call him an angel, it calls him God. It said he actually wrestled with God and uh, <laughs> through the night. And I think this is, uh, I think this was not a literal happening. I think it was a symbolic happening that perhaps Jacob had like a vision or dream experience where this was going on. And I think this went on in his mind. And I think it was a mental struggle that he went through between him and God. You ever have that happen in your life where you uh, kind of talking to God and kind of wrestling with God about what do you want me to do here or which direction should I go? And so I think he was uh, just like we wrestle with God uh, when we reach a, uh, a crisis in our own lives. And I think uh, that's, I think that's actually what happened to him because I, I doubt if he actually physically wrestled with a physical God. Yeah, but people back then related to an externalization of a, of a divine manifestation rather than an internal manifestation. So it, you know, he portrayed it as an actual literal wrestling match, but yeah, you, it probably was an internal struggle that he had to rise above, which we all go through those levels of initiation yeah, when you go through a crisis, and most of us have been through uh, several crises in life, it is like a wrestling match with God. And uh, uh, people, people often, even atheists, will uh, talk, talk to God in their own way. <laughs> you know, because all of us have uh, that invisible life uh, essence that we... Uh, uh, talk to when we're at a point of, of crisis and we go through spiritual wrestling matches about uh, what's going to happen. And I think after that happened, uh, after his spiritual encounter, that uh, he decided to just change his name. And uh, or he, may, he maybe had an impression come or a revelation come to him about changing his name. Well, J.J., I, I, I had suspicions of this, that, that it was within his mind. I, I guess, you know, just like it is today, when, when we deal with uh, things of the Spirit, sometimes the constraints of language come in and, and uh, we have a hard time explaining. But would, would, would that have been his soul that he was wrestling with and, and trying to get the blessing from? Or do you think well, he was, was uh, God? But for for uh, the the individual, uh, wrestling with God is really wrestling with your own soul, because your soul is a link to God. So uh, it would be a wrestling match with his own self, <laughs> his own higher self. So that's a good point. See, and one of the one of the uh, thoughts I had connected with this was, like, uh, there's been times if I lived closer to you. I would have either been uh, being really sick or or uh, really frustrated with life. I would have, uh, you know, if I would have lived closer to you, I would have come over and asked you and Artie for a blessing. But the now I'm of the opinion that we can get a blessing from our own soul that we aren't really, we don't really need to ask for an outside 
person to do that. Is, am I correct in that? Well, outside people can be a big help, though. It's like uh, when Jesus healed people, he told them, your faith has made you whole. But he stimulated their faith. And they, they couldn't do it completely on their own, even though he said they did. But, but he stimulated something in them that was beyond their own power to stimulate. And other people can do that for us when uh, uh, it's like a, a person goes to a Catholic priest and he confesses his sins and he feels better afterwards. Well, just confessing to a wall didn't do it, but confessing to another live person uh, made him feel better. It kind of eased the guilt. And uh, so o other people can help us a lot. And uh, so uh, sometimes it's, you can heal yourself. Uh, you can go so far, but there are times that it's good to get another person to cooperate in uh, assisting you with spiritual healing, uh, can they they can be a big benefit for you. So, uh, uh, you we can't complete our journey alone. We have to. We're made so we're interdependent on each other. And so we, that's a, that's we a really, principle, isn't it? Yeah, we really need each other. There may be some time I may need you. I may call on you for a blessing. And, uh, but, uh, uh, and you, it's possible you could do something for me I couldn't do for myself. But, uh, and this is all part of teaching us, teaching us that uh, uh, we're interdependent. And this is where all. This is why Jesus says, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Because he said, he made the statement, of myself I can do nothing. Because he included the power of his father and everybody else. Uh, he saw a merging of lives. He, he saw all life was one. And seeing that oneness, he could partake of it. But being separated from that oneness, yet he saw that there would be no power. But uh, okay. well, he, he, made, uh, he made that statement that uh, alone I can do nothing. But then, then we also have to temper that with the statement that with God all things are possible. And I take that to mean that with our soul all things are possible. And but right. and, and not also, really without also, everyone else. Also, it's important to realize that uh, God manifests through every individual. So with God, all things are possible. It's like saying, um, if I include all humanity, all things are possible. Okay. If I'm one with all life, all things are possible. But of yourself, of just you being all alone, well, all things are not possible. But when you see life as one and you being one with all life and you're not higher or lower, but we're all have uh, equal status with God, then all things become possible. Okay. okay, any more comment on that? Well, from a practical level, we all have blind spots in our personality, weaknesses, foibles, and if we allow other people in to see us as we truly are, then, you know, they can offer uh, insights that we may not be getting from our, from ourselves. We may not see ourselves clearly. Like, like Tyler, he could see all kinds of things in me maybe that I can't see. And, and so back to the level of trust, I can trust him to come from a higher point of love and I would be receptive to input that he might offer regarding any blind spots I might have or Stacy or Ken or you know that's that's how we kind of complete the the, the mosaic by connecting and leaning and listening to each other 
And Christine, she could even see things in me that no one else can see areas that I might well, need. To I felt very excluded, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I said <laughs> You felt my vibe. I'm, like, mm, I'm, yeah. I'm part of your envir right, environment right now. I'm part of all, so I'm here <laughs> reflecting something to you, whether you choose to see it or not. <laughs> we all have something to offer. <laughs> okay there's a just have time for a short question now and uh, then we'll continue this later but uh, here's one he says Jesus used individuals own faith to heal them except in the case of Lazarus what was the source on the norm nomenclature or the power he used in this instance Okay, so that goes along with what we're saying. When, when he healed people, he said, your faith has made you whole. But in the case of Lazarus, uh, Lazarus was dead. And uh, so how, how could he use Lazarus' own faith? Well, he could because Lazarus, even though he was separated from his body, he, was, uh, he could have still been uh had his consciousness nearby and it's quite po possible that uh, jesus did use lazarus own faith in other words when he uh, uh they removed the uh, uh lazarus from the tomb there so they he could approach him and uh, Jesus was, was a master, so he could be aware of Lazarus' presence, even though he wasn't in the body. And it's quite possible that Jesus communicated psychically with Lazarus, and he says, are you ready to return? Are you willing and able? And Lazarus says, if you speak the word. <laughs> and so Jesus... Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Boy, can you imagine that event happening? There he was dead for three days. And Jesus stretches forth his hand. Now, be, before he did that, though, he came to Martha and he asked her one question. He says, believest thou that I can do this? And she says, Lord. Uh, Yea, Lord, I believe. I can't remember the exact wording, but she expressed, yes, I have 100% belief in if you say so, it will happen. And so she was using the female energy, the believing energy of the female, uh, interplaying. Bet you didn't smell very good. Yeah, interplaying with the active energy of the male energy from Jesus, and that produced uh an extra uh sense of power and uh yeah he probably didn't smell too bad after he got all re restored there but uh after three days in the grave he may he may have actually not smelled that great <laughs> just before okay any comment uh, on that yeah yeah in the book of mormon was didn't the same thing happen uh, this gal came and wanted her husband restored, and he said, "My husband stinketh." <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, remember, remember, another person says to me, "He does not stink." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but everybody else. <laughs> They're talking about whether he stank or not. <laughs> no, I've got a question. Funny. I've got a question related to the the healing of people. In many instances in the Bible, before a healing is um, performed. Uh, casting out of evil spirits is done. Can you comment on on that and what? Uh, I don't know if it's every time, but it's a significant number of times that they they do that before the person is healed. Well, what what a true evil spirit is is it's negative. If a person is possessed by evil spirits, he's really possessed by wrong type of thinking and thoughts produce life and if your thoughts are incorrect and negative you produce an actual kind of life essence 
Okay, like a thought form. Right, like a thought form that can give you a lot of problems. So if you have, uh, say, epilepsy or a cancer, let's pick a cancer, for instance. That's, a, that's an evil spirit. In other words, it's a negative thought that is now materializing as a cancer. And if you have, or like Jesus, and had power to cast out that thought, that life, then the cancer would die and dissipate. And so this is what Jesus did. He, he cast out these uh, negative thought forms out of people. And he, of course, that, in that age, they just called them evil spirits. That's an interesting mechanism to think about. Like, how, how do you remove a thought form from someone? Like, I, I don't, you know, it's one thing to talk about, hey, you, you've got this kind of thought form, this idea that you have in your mind. You know, you're going to heal someone. Hey, so and so, you have cancer. You have these these um, kind of negative thought forms and, and ways of looking at things we need to clear up. It's one thing to talk about that and then you know remove it. It's it's another just to say, I'm you know get you get the hints from from here. Yeah, if, if the person is uh, sees these things as a evil spirit, then uh, the healer could just command the evil spirit to depart. And if, and he's speaking a language the person can identify with. Now, if the person is more advanced and sees this as a negative thought form, then the healer might use a different type of language, just casting out the negative energy. So he was casting out beliefs from their belief system. He was eliminating beliefs from their belief system. Right, right. He was altering their belief system. And, uh, that's amazing that's amazing you can do that yeah well, listen to it's, listen to the way people talk you know there much of uh people's conversation is very restrictive or negative or limiting and they repeat uh an idea a negative idea over and over and it becomes real to them so really you're just changing restructuring your your thought process to more to a more positive well, I, I understand that but i i've spent decades trying to eliminate some beliefs it's not it's, it's very easy to say to do but it's it's very difficult to do it in the in the real and uh, yet if you were to encounter a, a person like jesus he may be able to stimulate you to cast that out within a minute yeah but you may work your whole life doing it and not be able to do it if you're just on your own get an aha uh -huh. jj uh, before you before you close the meeting, uh, can I ask uh, Tyler if he's uh, he mentioned about us having a Zoom getting together and discussing the molecular business of projection of yours uh, and seeing where that could go and the possibilities of it and uh, get as many people uh, together on that Zoom as possible so that we can go over it and see what everybody thinks. Uh, either uh, let's put a yay or nay to it, put it to rest or get it going. So I'm, I'm curious to ask Tyler if he's still interested in uh, getting something like that together, and if so, to let us know individually. Well, I don't want to take over them. I wasn't necessarily uh, suggesting that I do that. I was just saying that if, if, if there's an interest, then, then someone should, should you know, create a group and, and start inviting people to do that. I'm, uh, I'm not sure I'm in a position to do that. I, I'm doing the citizen representatives. I'm trying to get some some effort with that and I'm I think it may um, divert from what I'm trying to do with that yeah that's a trouble you only everybody only has so much time to do so much okay we'll uh, wrap this up and all uh, also I want you everybody let me know uh, if you plan on coming to the gathering if we don't think we have enough people we're going to make it open to the other people on the keys but if we have enough people from the molecular group, uh, we'll just have us. Uh, otherwise, we'll, you know, invite some additional. So let me know on that. And in the meantime, uh, a great discussion. And we'll uh, cover. Are you going to be here next week, Scott? No, but but just continue with this because it. Uh, I'm going to be working the next two Sundays. Okay, well, we'll just wait a couple more weeks and finish these off then since... Uh, Are you sure? Well, yeah, you're...
you're always uh, got lots of questions, so you're a good one to have around when we do this. <laughs> so it'll well, be two more weeks where you can come. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe two weeks. Okay. Well, we'll uh, um, appreciate everybody showing up, and we will see you next Sunday at 10 a.m. All being well. All right. Thank Shine you. on.